Tonight from Boston, the hunt for the marathon bomber. Someone knows who did this. But they're still at the starting line. The FBI is investigating it as an act of terrorism. John Miller, Bob Orr, and Elaine Quijano have the latest, including what we now know about the bombs. We've learned the identities of two of the dead, a woman and an eight-year-old. Jeff Glor on Martin, the boy who put a face on the tragedy. Dr. John LaPoop tells us how the youngest of the wounded are being treated tonight. And Don Daler on the stories survivors are telling. Everybody was just uh, spectacular. It was the most well-organized response that I have seen in my entire life. This is the CBS Evening News with Scott Pelley reporting tonight from Boston. Good evening. No motive, no suspects. And the FBI is now asking for help to identify the Marathon bomber. They found a lot of evidence in the area behind us. We're just across the street from the Boston Public Library, next to Boylston Street, where two bombs exploded yesterday at the world's premier marathon. The FBI appeal to the public came this evening. The agent in charge, Richard Delaria, asked the public for leads and photographs and summed up the investigation this way. At this time, there are no claims of responsibility. The range of suspects and motives remains wide open. Investigators say this was one of the most photographed areas in the country yesterday. But did anyone capture the image of the person or persons who planted the bombs that killed at least three people and wounded more than 170, including spectator Leanne Yanni? I'm alive and being so close to the blast, you know, it, it could have turned out way worse. She was one of the lucky ones. 27 of the wounded remain in critical condition this evening. Among the dead, eight-year-old Martin Richard of Dorchester, Massachusetts. And late today, another of those killed was identified, 29-year-old Crystal Campbell of Medford. We've also learned more about the two bombs planted near the finish line. They were filled with nails and ball bearings designed to maim as many people as possible at an event that drew runners and spectators from all over the world. This was a heinous and cowardly act. And given what we now know about what took place, the FBI is investigating it as an act of terrorism. Terrorism on Patriots Day, a Massachusetts holiday that celebrates the opening shots of the American Revolution, known to many in Boston each year as Marathon Day. And we have just received word that the third person killed was a graduate student at Boston University. The president of the university posted an announcement a short time ago, but he did not identify the student. There were reports yesterday that one or more unexploded bombs were disarmed, but it turns out there were only two bombs and both of them exploded. Homeland Security correspondent Bob Orr is in Washington following the investigation. Law enforcement officials say the bombs contained an explosive similar to black powder. They were laced with BBs, ball bearings, and nails. Trauma surgeon George Velmahas says many of the injured have multiple shrapnel wounds. They are numerous, numerous. Um, there are people who have 10, 20, 30, 40 of them in their body or more. Investigators believe the bombs were hidden in black nylon backpacks and housed inside sealable metal pots called pressure cookers. Pressure cooker bombs can help boost the power of relatively small devices by briefly constraining the blast. And when the cookers do explode, they can add large chunks of metal to the shrapnel spray. The IEDs have been popular with terrorists. Al-Qaeda published a how-to recipe in an online jihadi magazine. Seven of the bombs were used in a 2006 attack on trains in Mumbai, India. In 2004 and 2010, the Department of Homeland Security warned law enforcement that pressure cooker bombs could present a threat in the U.S. In the failed Times Square attack in May 2010, a pressure cooker was found amid the bomb components in the back of the suspect's SUV. But the use of pressure cooker bombs does not necessarily point to an international terror connection. The FBI still can't rule out a domestic cell or lone wolf, 
and at the moment, investigators have no solid leads on who might be responsible. The FBI is studying surveillance videos and photos, hoping to spot the bomber in the crowd. And lead agent Rick Delorier is appealing for the public's help. We are asking anyone who may have heard someone speak about the marathon or the date of April 15th in any way that indicated that he or she may target the event to call us. Someone knows who did this. Investigators have now recovered pieces of the backpacks and the pressure cookers and we're told also parts of a circuit board. But Scott, the FBI at this hour does not know how the bombs were triggered. Bob, thanks very much. Our senior correspondent, John Miller, is in New York tonight. He's a former assistant director of the FBI. And John, thousands of people were at the race. All of them probably had cell phone cameras. How does the FBI sort through all of that? Well, first, Scott, they're very aggressive about making sure they get all of it. Something very interesting today at Logan Airport, as people were departing on international and domestic flights, the Customs and Border Patrol, the agents from Immigration and Customs Enforcement were greeting them on their way out and saying, before you get 3,000 miles away, do you have an iPhone? Do you have a camera? Did you take pictures at the marathon? Can we download that right now? Can we get that digital media from you? So they are going to be buried under a mountain of this stuff. And what they're going to do, Scott, is triage it. They're going to look at when it was taken in terms of how close to the explosion in terms of timing and where it was taken, how close to the two places where the bombs were placed, and they're going to go through those first. And then they will widen out in concentric circles and try to look at every piece they get. We just heard Special Agent Delaria ask everyone in the country for tips. How do they sift through all of that? Is there a danger that they'll just be overwhelmed by all of the information? They're prepared for a mountain of information. They've activated a system called Orion, which is a computer database that'll catalog every one of those leads and be searchable. And they're gonna deploy DIVS, the Digital Investigation Visualization System, which will help link leads and link them to any information in other FBI cases. Um, this is something they've been through before and they've gotten better at it. Fascinating, John, thanks very much. Some of those white tents that you see behind us were medical tents for the marathon and they turned out to be lifesavers. Here's Elaine Quijano. Is it tough to talk about this? Dr. John Pizzuto was a volunteer in the medical tent. He was treating a National Guardsman for foot blisters at the time of the explosions. People started to run all over the place, get panicky, and when he said, it's probably, that's definitely a bomb, we responded. Almost everyone in the tent rushed to the wounded. That's what changed me. That Five minutes, I was at the finish line to see the sidewalk that was now blood red, literally everywhere. What did it sound like? Um, a lot of orders being given, a lot of, not a lot of panic. I mean, the nurses, the doctors, they were like they were ready for this. They knew what to do. The battlefield injuries of one man are unforgettable. He came in in a wheelchair with a tourniquet around his right leg, his left leg, and basically his tibia bone there, his leg bone there, with nothing around it. No skin, no foot, no leg. What goes through a doctor's mind when you witness the carnage that you witnessed? At the time, I don't think you think about that. I think you just try to help the people. It's like police and fire and the physicians. You just try to help people who need help. But what sticks most in his mind is this woman he treated and the last thing she asked him before she left. What's your name? and you tell them your name and you get choked up because they're telling you, they're giving your name and now you're, they want to thank you and they thank you. And it's like, oh, this is real. Scott, it's estimated about half of those most severely injured survived because dozens of doctors and nurses were already on hand and were able to quickly triage the wounded. Thanks, Elaine. We're joined now by Deval Patrick, the governor of Massachusetts. Governor, the FBI does not seem to have much in the way of leads. I wonder if they have given you any reason to believe that there is an ongoing threat. Not that there's an ongoing threat, no. There's a very, very broad uh, and deep and I think methodical investigation going on now uh, at the blast site or the blast sites. And as you know, Scott, uh, and they've uh, talked about publicly, they are literally going through um, square inch by square inch uh, along a, a several block area 
uh, gathering and cataloging uh, evidence and, and putting together a scene and, and ultimately a, a case. And I think uh, I'm confident that uh, with time, and we'll have to give them the space um, uh, and have the patience to let them do their job, that with time there will be uh, uh, an arrest and we'll bring someone to justice or someone's. Governor, do you have any concerns about the way security was handled at the marathon yesterday, about how these b bombs got planted? Well, I have concerns because this happened. Um, I think everybody does. But remember, we've had 116 years of incident-free ma marathons. And every single year, we've learned lessons from the, uh, uh, from the marathon before. I am so, so regretful that this lesson is a tragic and bloody one. Uh, but we'll learn from this as well. And the marathon, I think, next year will probably be bigger and better than, uh, uh, than ever. Governor Deval Patrick, thank you for being with us. 76 patients remain in the hospital this evening. 17 of them are in critical condition. In some ways, the injured were lucky because medical teams were already at the finish line to help the runners, and some of the best hospitals in the world were nearby. We visited one of them, Brigham and Women's Hospital, a little bit earlier today. Brigham and Women's is five minutes by ambulance from the scene of the attack. Among those in the emergency department were trauma surgeon Joaquin Havens, Dr. Ron Walls, the chairman of emergency medicine, and trauma surgeon Dr. Zara Cooper. There were two things going, going through my head. One was actual fear um, myself, just because I hadn't been in such a situation like this before, and I really did feel like it was a war zone in some ways. Um, and then another feeling was reassurance, because I think that everybody really pulled together in a very remarkable way. The patients that you treated, what did you see? A significant amount of burns, uh, second and third degree burns, uh, as well as penetrating trauma from shrapnel to the face to the neck. Um, and to the upper extremities. There were uh, traumatic amputations from the blast. Um, very, very sick patients that needed help. Then there were three patients, I think three in total, who had uh, obviously planted or shrapnel that was part of the device. So small two to three millimeter ball bearing type or large BB pellet type objects and small carpenter nails about half a centimeter long. Nails and ball bearings, BBs, that you believe were part of the bomb itself? They wouldn't be out there anywhere unless they were part of the device. There have been a lot of advances in acute trauma care on the battlefield over these last 10 years. Did any of that come into play in the emergency department yesterday? Absolutely. And in fact, the, the conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan have taught us an incredible amount about how to manage wounds like this. The patients that you received, a lot of them had had first aid right there at the finish line of the race. Did that save some of the people? That Absolutely. Oh, Absolutely. Uh, we had patients arrive with tourniquets in place, which most certainly would have saved their lives from bleeding to death. Without the tourniquets, some of these patients could have bled to death before they ever reached the emergency department. Absolutely. Is there anything else in your experience that compares to this? The last time I saw the hospital anywhere near this was 9-11. Um, we were told to uh, prepare the hospital for an influx of burn patients. And then we all waited um, for many hours and nobody came. And this time we were able to help a lot more people. And that was great. Eight children were taken to Boston Children's Hospital and Dr. John LaPook has been talking to the people there. John, what'd you find out? Well, Scott, at Boston Children's Hospital, which is where most of the kids were taken, three kids remain. Now, there's the nine-year-old girl and the ten-year-old boy who had that very severe leg injuries. They were operated on yesterday. They remain in critical condition with breathing tubes. The one piece of very good news is that the two-year-old boy we talked about yesterday he had the head injury. He was in the intensive care unit. He's doing very, very well. He's talking. He's playing. One of the doctors told me he's covered by so many play toys and stuffed animals that you can barely see him. And what may be the best medical sign of all, he's eating chocolate chip pancakes. John, thank you. Good news. One child did not survive yesterday. He is Martin Richard. We'll have his story in a moment. And the role fate played in the tragedy when the CBS Evening News continues from Boston. Back now from Boston, 
For the spectators at the marathon, whether they lived or died, were injured or unharmed, was at least in part a matter of luck and where they were standing. Don Daler has a survivor story. A couple blocks over. And Long distance running is a shared passion for David Comstock and Susie Eisenberg Argo, the couples from Texas. When you cross that finish line, you're not crossing 26.2 miles. You're crossing probably, you know, 3,000 miles of training leading up to that event. This was his sixth Boston Marathon and her tenth. We agreed that she would run on the right side when she finished so that in the crowds I could pick her out, she could pick me out. And about uh, 100 yards to finish, uh, the bomb goes off. That's her, highlighted here, running just as they had planned. You can see her in this photograph at the moment of the second explosion. I look, I see the smoke coming out of the building. My immediate reaction was just shock. What does a bomb feel like? It was an explosion, and I felt just debris just hit me, but I didn't know what, did I, you see, I still did didn't Did you feel know. the force? I the did, explosion? I did, but I, you still don't, it's still, it was so quick. I didn't know what had happened. I was extremely worried. I didn't know where she was. I knew that she was expected to finish at the time, right when the blast occurred. And I kept going until I heard Dave screaming my name. When she came through, it was uh, you know, a moment of elation. The moment that we saw each other, we just embraced. Have you thought about what might have happened if you'd been on the other side of the road? Why we chose to go on the right side, it was meant to be. They say the they'll run in next year's there's Boston there's Marathon to prove to whoever did this so I, that life isn't defined by a single moment, but by many. Don Daler, CBS News, Boston. Martin Richard lived just eight years. The boy who left Americans heartbroken. Next. In Newtown last year, in Oklahoma City, 18 years ago, it was the faces of the children that brought home the enormity of the loss. And now, an eight-year-old child has become the symbol of the tragedy here in Boston. His name was Martin, and Jeff Glor has his story. This picture of Martin Richard was taken after a school project last April. Today, it is heartbreaking. In Dorchester, friends left flowers and a soccer ball for Martin, who played on the local team. Jose Calderon's kids were teammates. For a smile to everybody's face, whether we won or lost, he was always one of the brightest stars on our team. Family friends told us the Richards were nearly always together, like yesterday at the finish line of the race. They often ran together as a family. Martin's mother and younger sister were also injured in the blast. His father, Bill, released a statement asking for patience and privacy. My dear son Martin has died from injuries sustained in the attack on Boston. My wife and daughter are both recovering from serious injuries. We thank our family and friends for their thoughts and prayers. Tonight, so many in this city are thinking about a father and a family who lost a son and a neighborhood that lost one of its brightest lights. Scott Martin's mother suffered a serious head injury. His seven-year-old sister lost one of her legs. Jeff, thank you very much. One of the heroes at the finish line, the man in the cowboy hat, has experienced tragedy before. His story, just ahead. One of the striking scenes from the terror attack here in Boston came just after the explosions. The smoke hadn't cleared before some bystanders were jumping over the barricades to help strangers. One of those good Samaritans has quite a story himself, and here's Terrell Brown. This photo is one of the first captured shortly after the blasts went off. The man in the cowboy hat is 52-year-old Carlos Arredondo, who ran toward the chaos when others were running away. Blood is everywhere, people asking for help, people crying, and people running away. The smoke and the smell, too, was very powerful there. America has heard Arredondo's story before. When his 20-year-old son was killed in Iraq in 2004, he was inconsolable. In his agony and rage, he set a van on fire and received help through counseling. Seven years later, his other son committed suicide. Arredondo was at the marathon as part of his healing process, giving out flags at the finish line in honor of veterans. 
When the bomb went off, he ran to the aid of a man lying on the sidewalk, missing his legs. I went into the ground to comfort him and let him know that he's okay, the ambulance is on the way, they stay still, don't move. And I ended up picking him up from the ground to put him in a, in a wheelchair. They just arrived. You see yourself as a hero? No, I'm not. Why? Because I, I, I wasn't doing nothing different from the others first respond who arrived at the scene. Arredondo says he could not help his own sons, but he believes fate helped him to save someone else's son yesterday. What would they have thought of what you did yesterday? They will see it's a father who really care for, for others and also who love them and never going to forget them. As he left the scene yesterday, Arredondo had one flag left. He told those around him, America is bleeding. Terrell Brown, CBS News, Boston. The spirit of Boston. That's the CBS Evening News for tonight. For all of us at CBS News all around the world. I'm Scott Pelley in Boston. Good night.